let's take a look at our next one. Uh, like always, let's figure out what either what is the variable. Is it numerical or categorical? Or maybe we can just classify it directly as mean land or proportion land. All right, so to assess the impact of oral contraceptive use on bone mineral density, which we're going to abbreviate with the acronym BMD, researchers in Canada carried out a study comparing BMD for women who had used oral contraceptives for at least three months to the BMD for women who had never used oral contraceptives. Data on BMD in grams per centimeter is given below. So we've got some data from women who had never used oral contraceptives, and we're talking about the pill basically, and for those who had used oral contraceptives. And we're trying to figure out if your bone mineral density is the same or different depending on whether you've used the pill. And, and it's an important question, right? If you're on the pill, does that mean you're gonna have weaker bones, stronger bones, the same bones? We gotta, we gotta figure this out. So let's see, it says the authors of the paper believed that it was reasonable to view the samples used in the study as representatives of the two populations of interest. Use the given information and a significance level of 5% to determine whether there is evidence that women who use oral contraceptives have a lower BMD than women who have never used oral contraceptives. All right, so in going through this, a couple of things that I see. First of all, if I'm trying to assess am I in mean land or category, or excuse me, or proportion land, if you're looking at this data, I can tell right out the gate I'm in mean land because I see these numbers that are over one. Right? And none of our proportions will ever be larger than one. So I'm definitely in mean land. Plus, I saw units here, right? Grams per centimeter. Anytime you see units, you know you're going to be in mean land because proportions, their units are percentages, right? Those are frequency counts that have been turned into relative frequencies. And that's just not the case here. So I've got mean land. And you can see I have two samples, right? I have two treatments. I have two women, or two different sets of women, um, women who used, excuse me, who had never used the pill and women who had used the pill. So I have two samples. All right. Now we have to decide, once we say two samples, that your next question has to be, well, are these independent or are these paired? Does the bone mineral density of these women have any effect on the bone mineral density of these women? And the answer is no, right? I, I wouldn't even know how to control my bone mineral density regardless of whether I was on the pill or not. So the BMD for these women, nothing to do with the BMD for these women. So these are independent samples, okay? And I'm gonna use a t-test. All right, so with that, let's see if we can start to pick apart some of our 13 steps. So step one, I'm gonna define some parameters. All right, because I'm in mean land, I'm gonna write muse. I get it every semester where students know they're in mean land, but they still write P here. So be careful, make sure you're using the appropriate letter. So this is going to be, I'll call this the mu1, the true average BMD for the women who had never used oral contraceptives. And this is in grams per centimeter. All right, those were my units. Now, mu sub 2 would be the true average BMD for women who had used oral contraceptives. Okay. All right. So we got that. So let's take a look. Steps 2 and 3 are going to be my null and alternate. I'm going to scooch this up a little bit. All right, so that we get rid of the setup, but I still want my data in view if I can. All right, so steps two and three, we've got our null and we've got our alternate we've got to come up with. All right, now I want to refer back to that summary sheet. Right Here we're in two sample land, okay? So because I have two samples, I've got to decide did I have means or proportions? I had means. So for our hypothesis test over here, you can write it one of two ways. Most of the time I'll just write mu sub 1 equals mu sub 2. 
You could also write that the difference is equal to zero. That's totally fine, but I'm gonna opt for this version. So let's do mu sub one equals mu sub two. Okay, so mu sub one equals mu sub two. And I'm not sure if you heard it, but right at the end, right, we see is there evidence, meaning run a hypothesis test, but it says women who use oral contraceptives have a lower BMD than women who do not use low oral contraceptives. So they actually think mu sub two might be lower. So I'm gonna write this as mu sub one is greater than mu sub two. All right. Now, if you had written the, the means in the other direction, if these were the used and these were the never used, then you would have the less than alternate. And for the most part, our work would be the same. We'd, we'd wind up with the same conclusion for sure. We just get there slightly different, differently. Okay, so here we go. Step four, um, what is your alpha? It looks like it was 5%. Okay, our assumptions. Let's see. All right, so I'm gonna refer to my summary sheet here. So it looks like I need either randomly selected samples or samples that represent the population or treatments that were randomly assigned. So if you look here, there is this little blurb, right? The authors of the paper believed that it was reasonable, reasonable to view the samples as representatives or as samples used in the study as representatives of the two populations. So we actually have the op option here that our samples represent populations. This might be the first time in this class we're doing one with this type of setup, but ultimately that's what you want out of your sample anyways. You want it to represent your population. You want it to look like your population just on a smaller scale so that you don't have to run that census. All right, for assumption number two, we need to just state the fact that we have independent samples. All right, and again, these are independent. The bone mineral density for women who don't use the pill has no effect on the bone mineral density for women who do. And it's important to state that they're independent because we're using this method in independent land. When we get to the next example, we're gonna show you what you do when they're paired. But they're not, so, so let's keep with this, right? So we've got independent samples here. Normality, the big one, the one we're always looking for. All right, so let's take a look. So in terms of normality, I could either have that my population distributions are normal. All right, if that wasn't stated, then the CLT can kick in as long as both sample sizes are 30 or higher, or we might have to make two plots for normal or for plausible normality, which means relatively little skewness and no outliers. So let's see. Was my population stated as normal? And if you brush back through this problem, nowhere in there is the word normal. All right, were my sample sizes large enough for the central limit theorem to kick in? Well, the answer is no. In each of these groups, you have 10 women. All right, so you get to the third option where you're gonna have to make two types of plots, and that's what we're gonna do here. So I actually need to get two box plots going on. So let's see what we got. I'm gonna go into my stat plots. It looks like I've got one of them on and ready to go. And I, I already put my data into my list. So if you need to pause the video and put your data in, no problem. But it looks like plot one is on. I need to turn plot two on and I need to change this to L, L2. All right, because I wanna make sure I have the list for the women who use the pill. I need the data for that list. Or I should say, I need the plot that represents that data. Okay, so we'll put that into L2. Let's hit zoom nine, and we're getting something like that. Now, as I look, th these are pretty good box plots, right? Our sample sizes are pretty small. I only had 10 women in each, so that's not too bad. Now, these are the never used up here. These are the used down here. It doesn't matter which order you go in as long as you have one of each, but you do need to sketch both of these onto your write-up for me. All right, so I have the don't use, actually, let me, Take a look, so don't use. I 
and use. So this was don't use. All right. Both of these box plots are roughly symmetric with no outliers. which is great, so I can assume that there is plausible normality, okay? Now, step four is, hey, what were those sample standard deviations? Now, if I want my sample standard deviations, well, I've got my data in L1 and L2, so I can run one of our stats off of L1, read the sample standard deviation, read one of our stats off of L2, read the sample standard deviation, and that'd be all fine and good. I'm gonna put a pin in those right now because I really want us to get into the habit of taking our calculator's output screen and having it inform your write-up. And I'm gonna, the reason I'm gonna put a pin in this right now, I, I will come back to this, is because my calculator output screen is gonna give me these two numbers just when I run the two sample t-test, all right? Now, you can still get them from one of our stats and, and let me show you what I mean. All right, if you wanted to, you can do one of our stats off of L1, and you can read S1. It's right there at 0.159, or really 0 0.160 if you round up. All right, I can do the same thing for L2, sub two, or L2 and find out that that sample standard deviation was 0.139. But again, I really want us to get in the habit of using our calculator's output screen to help us with our write-up. So I'm going to circle back to this one, okay? All right. So let's try step six. I'm going to do this over here. So step six, I have the t-distribution. All right, in step seven, again, I have two samples. I'm in mainland. I'm running a t-hypothesis test. All right, step eight is my degrees of freedom. And this is the next thing that I'm gonna use technology to help me get, all right? Now, if I look at this, you have to think collectively, you have about 20 women. Not even about, you have 20 women in your study. So if you lost a degree of freedom for the women in the never used group and a degree of freedom for the women in the used group, you have about 18 degrees of freedom-ish. I'm gonna put approximate. And we could use that big old formula and get our degrees of freedom, but it's not worth it. So I want you to hear that your degrees of freedom is close to 18. But when we do what we call a conservative estimate, we take our smaller sample size, and again, in this case, as was example two, the, these both have the same sample size. They're both sample sizes of 10. Right, so I know my degrees of freedom are at least nine. Right? They're closer to 18 than they are to nine, but this is a conservative estimate. But again, I'm gonna erase this because I'm gonna get this number from my calculator in just a bit, okay? All right, so let me write up my formula for step nine. All right. And if you have trouble remembering what it is, I don't blame you, it's pretty ugly but it's here on this, this write-up, yeah? So I'm gonna have my statistic minus my parameter, a standard error, right? With degrees of freedom read from the calculator, there is a little note. So I'm gonna copy this formula down for step nine. Let me move this up. All right, so step nine, we have T equaling X1 bar minus X2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 over the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. All right, so there's my test statistic written out in numbers, or excuse me, in, with formulas. And now I'm gonna plug in my numbers. And I don't know all of these yet. Again, in a moment, I'm gonna go to my calculator and you're gonna see my calculator inform my write-up. So right now, I don't know x1 bar or x2 bar. You could run one of our stats and figure them out, and that's fine. You're more than welcome to do that. 
And similarly, I don't know S1 and S2, right? We left it blank on our assumptions. I do happen to know N1 and N2. These are both 10. All right, so when I get down to this denominator, I know I'm going to have a 10 here and a 10 here. All right, I don't know what's going to be in these parentheses, but I know if the null is true, this difference is zero. All right, so I'm getting closer to filling this in. So I'm going to hop over to my calculator. I want you to see how to run this on your calculator. And then when we come back, we're going to take that calculator output screen and we're going to fill in not just uh, the standard deviations, but the degrees of freedom and step 10 and step 11 and step 12. So we're going to use that calculator output to inform our write-up. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Hey guys, let's take a look at how we would run a two-sample t-test if this time I actually did give you the raw data. And just to remind you of how I could have gotten my two box plots for my assumptions and these sample standard deviations, I want to show you one way to do it. Again, I wouldn't recommend it because when we get to our calculator output screen from two sample t-testing, all of it's going to be there. Not the box plots, but the, these S numbers. So if I wanted to check the box plots, right, I have my data in L1 and L2, and I've got my box plots ready to go. Right? And you can see I have two of them on. I've got L1, so I've got the women who have never used oral contraceptives in L1, and I've got plot two with the women um, who have used oral contraceptives for their bone mineral density. So if I hit zoom nine here, there's where my two box plots are coming from. And I just screen grabbed it. You can see it down here. Now, if you wanted to get the sample standard deviations, this is one way to do it. You could hit stat, calc, enter, and we could tell our calculator, hey, can you please get me the standard deviation from L1? And you can see it right there with 0.16. All right, and I could rerun this again, but change this out to L2, right? And then you can see the sample standard deviation there of 0.14, and that's what I have down here. So that is one way to get the sample standard deviations. And again, I'm gonna argue against it because there's a lot of button clicking, and I'm just gonna get it from my output screen. So let's go figure out how to do this if we just use one of our tests. Okay, so again, two samples, right, we're in mean land, that takes us down to option three and four, and we actually have to use option four right now. We don't have the option to use two sample z-test, the sample size is not large enough for the central limit theorem to kick in, we don't have any information about the population, we only have statistics, so I'm going to use option four down here, all right, and where this example is different than example two is that we have the raw data, so I'm going to switch this over to data and I get a different interface, a different screen, because it's really interesting what lists do you have the data in. And I have them in L1 and L2. I'm going to keep their frequencies as one because I entered each data value exactly once. All right, let's see our alternate. It looks like, again, we have a greater than alternate. Um, and that is what was selected here. I'm not going to pull my data, so let me head down. All right, and I'm going to hit calculate. All right, and there's my test statistic popping up, there's my p-value, there's my degrees of freedom, and here is my sample mean, right, that I would have used in step 10. Um, here's the other sample mean, and here come all the sample standard deviations. So everything you need for steps 10, 11, and we'll get there at 12, are going to come in that output screen which is why I don't really need to run one bar stats L1, L2, or one bar stats L1, excuse me, and then one bar stats L2 to get all that information. It's going to come from the two sample t-test output screen. And if I hit stat test, and now let me go ahead and draw, we should see some kind of area under a curve, right? It's a right-tailed test, and the p-value is about 14%. Oh, and we can see my box plots hanging out up there, which is fine. I mean, you get the gist of what this would look like anyways, right? Standard, well, not standard normal curve. We're on the T curve, right? It looks like the standard normal curve. Zero's under the peak, right? There's my test statistic of 1.13 on that T-axis, and I'm going to shade about 14%, right? So if you look at my write-up, you've got that graph that I screen grabbed, but you see me labeling my axis with T. There's my 1.35. You also could have used TCDF to get here, right? And it's just if you use TCDF, you do need the degrees of freedom. And we usually get our degrees of freedom from our technology anyways. So you might as well just go with the, um, the p-value that the two sample t-test passed.
um, pops back out. And if you wanted a conservative estimate for degrees of freedom, right, we had 10 women in each group. So because those sample sizes are the same, the smaller of the sample sizes is still size 10. So we knew we had at least nine degrees of freedom. And it's much closer to 20, but it, we can go with nine and be safe. All right, so with that, I'm gonna flip back and we're gonna finish up our write-up, okay? I'll see you in a bit, bye. Okay, we're back. Let's review everything we just did on our calculator. All right, so when we clear this out, I'm gonna hit stat, go over to tests. I'm gonna go to two sample t-test. All right, this time I have data, so I'm gonna go over here to data. And I have my first variable in L1, my second variable in L2, and since I wrote in each of those data values exactly once, I'll set my frequencies to one. Uh, we had a greater than alternate. I will never pull my data. So I will go all the way down here and hit calculate. And let's start reading some interesting things. So first of all, I see my degrees of freedom, 17.665, all right. You can't see them right now, but if I scroll down, there's S sub 1 and S sub 2. So this looks like it's about 0.16, and this was 0.13. So let me write those in here. S sub 1 is 0.16, S sub 2 is 0.13. All right, in terms of my averages, if I scroll back up, I have my first average was one point, or my sample mean was 1.08 and then 1.004. So we've got 1.08 minus 1.004. We knew our sample standard deviations were 0.16 and 0.13 respectively. So I've got all of those numbers filled in. And then on top of that, I don't have to put this into the calculator. I know that that test statistic is 1.13. Okay, I also see my p-value here. It's about 14%. So let me scroll down just a bit and let's get that in. So I wanna be super clear. If you wanna write this on your write-up, if you just wanna say, hey, my p-value is 0.14, totally acceptable, okay? What I wanna just unpack a little bit more is how you can get from step 10 to step 11 without this, this um, output screen. Like, how do you get there? because I will have those types of problems floating around where you can't use two sample t-test. So let's talk about how I could get from here to 14%. All right, so my p-value is a probability. We're on the t-distribution. My alternate is greater than, and my test statistic from step 10 was 1.13. Anytime you wanna get a p-value, you want the area under this right tail, because probabilities are area under a curve, you would use some kind of CDF. Since we're on the T-curve, we're gonna use TCDF. So we're gonna go low, high, and our degrees of freedom was 17.665. Okay, so let's see what that number is. If I hit TCDF, oops, I went the wrong way, excuse me. Can we see that? There we go, TCDF, low, high, oops, high, degrees of freedom. And I want you to remember this number, this 0.1358. When I hit enter, you can see it's pretty close, right? I would still say about 14%. Okay. And then the question pops up, and it's a great question. Well, if I didn't know my degrees of freedom from my calculator, how would I know to put in 17.665? Well, it's what I was saying before, is you would go with a conservative estimate. You knew your smaller sample size was 10, so you have at least nine degrees of freedom. We actually know it's closer to 18, which in an all actuality it's 17.6, but you know you have at least nine degrees of freedom. So if I headed over here and I was like, well, darn, I don't know how many degrees of freedom I have. Just use that conservative estimate of nine and you still get your 14%, right? It hasn't changed that much. So that's what we mean when we say a conservative estimate, right? If you're plugging in nine, that's definitely on the safe side. You, you'll have a little bit more variability because you only have the nine degrees of freedom. So your p-value would be a little bit higher. Okay, you're just a little bit less likely to reject the null, that's fine. All right, ooh, last but not least, we gotta go ahead and draw this one out. 
And again, if I have 14% of my area, or my if my area, ugh, if my p value is 14%, I should see some area under that curve. Well, you can see my box plots are showing up. I forgot to turn them off, so they're within view. And there's that area under the curve, that's 14%. If you wanna turn them off, you can. All right, so I can turn both of these off. And then I can rerun this just so we can see it without the box plots. Oops, I forgot to draw. There we go. And it'll take it a moment, but now the box plots won't show up. All right, and so I'm gonna take this graph from my calculator, transfer it onto my write-up, and I'll remember to shade that right tail. So let me move this up so we have it in view. Oops. There we go. So I've got my graph that I want to make. All right. So I have a T distribution. I know zero is under the peak. 1.13 is somewhere around here and I have a right-tailed test. All right, decision time. So let's look at our p-value, which is 14%. That is greater than my alpha. So because our p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject H0. All right, and when you fail to reject H0, you do not have sufficient evidence, right? So our second sentence, we do not have sufficient evidence All right, and let's go back and look at the words that we were given so we can just repeat them. What do we not have sufficient evidence for? All right, so if I go all the way back, right, this is saying we do not have sufficient evidence that women who use oral contraceptives have a lower BMT, BMD excuse me, than women who have never used oral contraceptives. So I'm gonna just rewrite this phrase back over. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I wanna be efficient. All right, so let's, let's go write that up. All right, so we do not have sufficient evidence that women who use oral contraceptives have a lower BMD than women who have never used oral contraceptives. Okay, and this is, this is a good thing. That means if you go on the pill, you, you got no reason to think that your bones are gonna get weaker. Okay, fantastic. Now, I, I wanna point out, again, if this had been a less than, and I know it's not, but if it had been, if this was less than, you would remove these two words, you would not have the words fail to, and you would not have the words do not. All right, so you would cross out these two words and these two words, and then the write-ups would be the exact same. So these write-ups are super similar, regardless of whether you're gonna reject or fail to reject, it's just a difference of four words. All right, and again, potentially, you might have made a type two error here. And if you did, great. Well, not if you did, great. Hopefully you didn't. The only way to know that is to run the census. But whenever you fail to reject the null, you might have made a type 2 error. All right, so with that, we're going to learn how to run a paired t-test next. So what do we do when our samples are paired? All right, I'll see you in a bit. Bye.